I'm Marvin Polis from the City of Edmonton at Edmonton City Hall. With me today is Matthew Dance from the University of Alberta. He's a graduate student at the University of Alberta, and we're here to talk about ambient air quality. Before we get started, Matthew, tell me a little bit about your background. Um, as you mentioned, Marvin, I'm a grad student at the University of Alberta in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, prior to that, I worked at the Clean Air Strategic Alliance as a project manager, helping with a multi-stakeholder collaborative consensus-based process for developing air quality policy. And I also worked as an independent contractor, primarily for the government of Alberta, doing environmental policy development as well. I guess it would be true to say that the environment is a bit of a passion for you. Yes, yes, I am very passionate about the environment, how we, uh, how we use the environment, what we put into the environment, what we take out of the environment. Well, we are here to talk about ambient air quality. So first of all, Matthew, tell me, what is ambient air quality? Ambient being the air around us, it, it implies outside as, oppo as opposed to indoor air quality. And air quality is simply um, kind of the relationship between emissions going into the air and the ability of the atmosphere to absorb and disperse those emissions. If the atmosphere is uh, absorbing and dispersing those emissions, we typically have good air quality. If the atmosphere isn't able to do that, we have poorer air quality. So the atmosphere actually, you say, disperses emissions? So we can put bad stuff into the air and it can just go away? The solution to pollution is dilution, as they say. So uh, it, it doesn't go away. It just uh, is less likely to impact uh, human and ecosystem health if the amount of emissions that we're putting to the air is within a, a capacity of the air to absorb it and disperse it. So is the human race now putting so many things into the air that dispersion is not what it used to be, so to speak? In Edmonton specifically, some days we have very poor air quality. Um, I, I think Alberta Environment says that Alberta or Edmonton has good air quality over 90% of the time. And the times that we don't have good air quality are often a result of a temperature inversion, where there's um, almost a layer of air over the city that, a lot, that doesn't allow the pollution to dissipate uh, from the city. So even here in Alberta, clean, pristine Alberta, we sometimes have bad air quality. Yes, um, often as a result of temperature inversions and uh, natural events like forest fires. So, uh, if you recall last summer or the summer before, or I'm sure coming up this summer, if there are big fires in the mountains or uh, adjacent to, uh, to Edmonton, we'll often get that smoke in the city that impacts the air quality, impacts how people can breathe, uh, and impacts the ecosystems within and around Edmonton. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more then. How does air quality affect human health, either to the positive or to the negative? Generally speaking, uh, if we have good air quality, we're able to uh, live and breathe and move through the environment very easily through the ur urban center. People can go for runs, that type of thing. Poor air quality uh, impacts almost the most vulnerable in, in, the, in, in Edmonton. So if you have a respiratory illness like asthma, you, you feel that, you feel a tightening in your chest. Prolonged exposure to poor air quality can actually damage a person's uh, respiratory system, their lungs, that type of thing. On poor air quality days, you'll also see admissions to uh, the emergency departments in the city spike as, as a result of people feeling that uh, as, they, as they're trying to live their lives. Now you mentioned some statistics a few moments ago, so clearly air quality is measured in Alberta. How do we go about doing this? Essentially, the four ambient air quality monitoring stations in Edmonton um, measure a number of different parameters, uh, particulate matter, uh, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, um, in an attempt to characterize them and express what people are breathing on the street. So Matthew, obviously monitoring air quality is, is a very important thing. What can be done to improve this? Um, the four ambient air quality monitoring stations in Edmonton are not always located where people are. So for instance, the station uh, in downtown Edmonton at the corner of 104th Street and 102nd Avenue is located at the top of a building. So it's pulling air into, the, into its sensors from two or three stories up. I think that we should look at new technologies to see whether or not there's a way of getting air quality readings where people are driving, uh, where people are walking. So try and get readings along uh, major traffic and pedestrian ways. So that would seem to make sense. So with all this monitoring going on, tell me, I mean, at, at the end of the day, do we have good air quality in Edmonton? 
I think that's a hard question to answer. Uh, the data that we have for the locations that we're gathering data indicate that we do, over 90% of the time, have good air quality in Edmonton. Um, I have questions, though, about where, uh, where there's a lot of traffic, where there's uh, area source emissions, like uh, some of the small in industries in, in the city. We don't monitor there, so it's very difficult to know what the air quality is next to the white mud or next to uh, the rail yards in, in southeast Edmonton. Okay, so you're saying that the air quality can actually fluctuate in different parts of the city, different altitudes, different the south end, the north end. Temporal and spatial variations are, are, uh, are known to happen in air quality. And, and again, with the, with the four locations that we have, a, we have a very good understanding of what happens over time and um, over the space of, of that area. What we don't know is uh, where we don't monitor. So new technologies like uh, MIT Sensibility City Lab have recently released something called a Copenhagen wheel. It's a standard wheel that fits on most bikes that has a uh, sensor that detects knocks and it has a GPS monitor in it. So you can uh, know where you're getting the readings from. If citizens were enabled to put these on their bikes and to report the data to some porthole that the city hosted, then there'd be a way for uh, regular citizens to, just in the course of their day when they're riding their bikes, to collect data that would tell us what's going on in the areas that we don't monitor data in. Right. So I guess knowing where the good air is and where the bad air is is part of the equation, but then we need to do something about it, right? Yeah. We need to fix things up, I guess, if you yeah. want to put it that way. So what can Edmontonians do to actually improve the air quality? I think the city of Edmonton is taking an incredible lead by um, thinking more holistically about urban form and transportation. So the transportation master plan, the way we move, is, was being developed and has been developed in conjunction with the uh, municipal development plan, the urban planning master document, uh, the way we grow. The, the two documents are being conceived together as a way of trying to shift folks out of cars. So. Cars are regulated at a federal and provincial level. The way that cities can get at trying to manage the emissions from vehicles is to uh, get folks out of cars and into uh, an LRT, uh, expanding LRT. That, I think, is, is a great way to move people through a city. The City of London also has some innovative ways. They have something called a congestion charge zone, which um, imposes a tax on folks who are driving into the downtown core. It's a way of trying to manage the number of cars in the downtown of uh, the City of London, and it's also a way, uh, by virtue of doing that, of managing the emissions associated with those cars in, in downtown London. It's a tax. That's not always a, a positive thing, but thinking about how we can um, control where vehicles go or uh, the number of vehicles on our roadways, given that we're a, a growing city, there's a growing economy and a growing population, I think is uh, looking to the future. I think that there's a potential to get really good health outcomes from an urban form where folks are encouraged and supported in the urban form to think about alternative ways of getting around. So, you know, being able to walk in your neighborhood to go and get a, uh, a carton of milk, I think is important. So that the option is there for folks to do something other than get in their car and drive to, drive to a corner store. That they can walk, they could ride their bike. How far will, are people willing to walk if it's cold? We are a cold city. So how far away could a grocery store be before someone decides to get in a car at minus 20 or minus 30 Celsius? I guess in a more compact city where things are denser, that grocery store isn't that far away. In the best case scenario, I think so.